look, I usually have to sell it a little, but I am genuinely extremely excited to have you on the show. Uh, they asked me when I got on the phone with your team because we reached out when we saw the, the dev kit that you guys have right now. So this is on the Tense Torrent side. Um, and I was like, okay, obviously, whatever Jim's working on is probably cool as shit. So... No. Maybe there's something here, and so I scheduled a call. To, it's just exploratory call, and they go, "Oh, well, you know, do you want to talk to Jim?" And I'm like, "Well, we don't really take guests on our show anymore, but um, yes, we'll make an exception. <laughs> yeah. That would be great." Wow. I don't want to waste anyone's time, which is actually a big part of the reason we don't take guests. We are notorious for starting our show anywhere from one to three hours late, and. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> We hate doing that to important people. So without further ado, I want to get into some of the community submitted questions. We announced that you were going to be joining us sure. and it would have been a huge disappointment if you weren't here, but you are. So Dylan asks, hey, Jim, I'm a junior computer engineering student about to start my first internship doing verification engineering at a big chimp company. First of all, did I just say chimp company? Anywho, doesn't matter. The point is, congratulations, Dylan. He says, it's great to see how far open source has gone. Uh, we even learn Risk Five in our introductory hardware course. Oh, cool! So, first of all, I want to I want to start with letting you talk about Risk Five a little bit because that's obviously a hugely important part of what Tense Torrent is doing right now. And I guess I realized I didn't really talk about Tense Torrent at all. So, do you want to give us a short introduction to what exactly drew you to this company and to their mission? Wow, okay, so Tensor is an AI computer design company. We're designing a high-end AI engine and also a high-end RISC-V processor. And I think, yeah, a AI has gone through a lot of evolution. And, you know, it started running on CPUs and then GPUs, and then I think Google announced the Tensor processor in 2015. And we're building essentially an array of Tensor processors that's programmable with open source. Uh, software stock that we released in January. And then there's going to be a combination of AI computing and, and general purpose computing tied together. And we decided to make a high end RISC V processor. Our AI processor also uses little RISC V cores, you know, to drive the execution of the big tensor processor. So, and yeah, so the, and the RISC V thing is really interesting because, you know, at some level, computer architectures are generic. It doesn't really matter very much if it's x86, PowerPC, MIPS, Alpha, ARM, or RISC-5, but only RISC-5 is open. And the Berkeley guys that started it were pretty good. And the cool thing about open source, you know, as we saw with Linux is, when it's open source, a whole bunch of people can work on it. It's a, it's a much better innovation platform. And there's a, it's a one-way door. When people go from you know proprietary technology to open source, they literally never go back. Linux killed literally all the proprietary Unix operating systems. And I think solely RISC-V is going to take over the computing world, which is pretty fun. Just want to say- To your student if, friends, go, go ahead. I was just going to say, if I'm one of those Berkeley guys, I'm putting, uh, Jim Keller said I'm pretty good on my LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> Like immediately. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. they're pretty good. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I could tell funny stories about like, you know, computer science in universities and computer science and high end computer design companies, they, they kind of work together. And it's really interesting because a team of 100 people who work together for five years can refine that crap out of somebody, something. Whereas students, you know, they get a project and sometimes without that much support. And some of those projects are pretty good, and some of them, it's hard for it to add up to a lot, let's say. So uh, you've- But like, like the branch predictors everybody uses came out of universities, and the RISC-V architecture, which is gonna, let's say, dominate computing in 10 years, 10 years. Is, came out of universities, and now there's 20 odd companies building RISC-V computers and way more using it, so. Whether yeah, you did it on purpose, phenomenon. Uh, or whether you did it by accident, you actually transitioned me perfectly into the second half of Dylan's question. And uh, this is really cool, because okay. he asked for getting into a higher level architect slash designer position. If you want to work on one of those teams, are you going to recommend mm -hmm. stay in school, go for the PhD, or do you want years in industry? What are you looking for? I, well, 
So PhDs are really good for some people if you really have a research topic and you really want to go think really hard. But if you want, like, I didn't study computer design in college. I'm, I'm an electrical engineer. You know, my, my major is first electromagnetic fields. And then <laughs> when I, my, my advisor ran the, the semiconductor physics lab. So I learned about, a lot about that. And then I took one logic design course and then got a job doing that. And then I got a d job at digital where I worked for a great architect, Bob Stewart. And then computer architects, good ones, know about a lot of different things. So I learned how to program, you know, do logic design. I know about semiconductor physics. I, I know a weird amount about packaging and, you know, signal integrity and all kind of stuff. And so if you want to be a computer architect, you should probably work on a lot of different things. And most computer architects that are really good at it didn't do it in college, uh, you know, as a PhD. Interestingly enough, I, it's, it's almost like a too narrow of a way to go about it. PhD guys tend to be experts in something. And that makes computer sense. Computer architects tend to be tend to be generalists. I'd say. Yeah. So you already kind of alluded to this one as well, but William asks. I mean, you've obviously got experience on the ARM side. You've got experience on the x86 side. You've got experience on the Risk Five side. Um, William asks, how far do you think x86-64 can go? I mean, you're telling me now. You're saying, look, risk five is going to be the future. You gave that number 10 years. I'm not going to hold you to it. I mean, I can't promise nobody else will, but I'm not going to hold you to it. Um, is that because x86 is out of gas, or is it because risk five has just got some kind of fuel that we're only just discovering the potential for in the engine? Which, which one is it? Neither. So computers generically, you know, they fetch instructions, decode them, and issue them, right? And the thing that makes the front end of a computer fast is how many instructions can you decode and how well can you predict the instruction stream, right? So x86 has a deficit in the sense that, you know, random length instructions are harder to predict, but we sort of figured that out. It's just harder to do but it's not like a big limitation. And then the execution engine goes fast because you have lots of parallel execution units and out of order issue, which is generic to computers. And then you have a good memory system with a really good predictor for where the data is coming from, which has nothing to do with the architecture. So I'd say x86 has a limitation. So it's 16 registers, variable length instruction set, and it sort of has a pile of old crud that nobody actually needs, but you have to build. So, so it has a tax. Right. But computer performance is mostly today based on prediction. And the number of predictors in a modern computer is crazy. We predict, obviously, like where the instruction stream's coming from, where the next branch is, the direction of the branch, call return stack. We predict the width and grouping of instructions. We sometimes predict the results of instructions. So we tell me this. Where the data is oh. coming from. So it's all a prediction. Uh, one of the, uh, a follow-up question from William is, you know, could we see cores using multiple architectures? Could you see someone like an Intel or an AMD, an x86 license holder, taking uh, uh, some kind of RISC-V architecture, AI processor, coprocessor, and using that for prediction? Like an AI accelerant uh, on a traditional, does it just not make any sense? I mean, tell me. If it's a dumb question, I'd love to know. Yeah, it probably doesn't make very much sense. So computers are very optimized around a, you know, a particular instruction set. Today, there's pretty good binary translators, and they keep getting better. And binary translation from like an ARM instruction set to RISC-5 is relatively easy and back and forth. So you'll probably pick your general purpose computing architecture and then either recompile all the code or translate the code you need. Like Apple switched from x86 architecture to ARM architecture. They hardly missed the beat. Nobody even noticed or cared. And that's some great. Of that's the Apple ecosystem and software build. But they could switch to RISC-V and nobody would notice or care either. 
This is hilarious. Uh, he keeps beating me to what my next thing is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all prediction, right? So I just don't hey, even... Why do, I even, why do I bother talking? Well, um, we live in a simulation, and a good simulator predicts everything. And so. <laughs> so the next thing I was going to... Wait this. The next thing from William's question that I was going to focus on. So, okay. so he asked, okay, how far will x86 go? Do you think Armor Risk 5 will replace it in the future? Uh, maybe we'll see using multiple architectures. So that's all William's question so far. I'm not taking any credit for that or blame. But what I will take credit or blame for is this next one. I was really focused on the word replace in his question. And you brought up mm -hmm. needing to recompile code. And software is something that I feel like is a a bit of an elephant in the room, you know, when you talk about how well, you know, fu fundamentally all processors are the same, essentially, it's like how many instructions can you process, but while Rosetta 2 was an absolute marvel um, to the point where just a few years ago, I wouldn't have even shortlisted William's question, let alone asked it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but now that I've seen what Apple was able to do with that x86 to ARM transition, um, and what Qualcomm is claiming that they're doing on their upcoming Snapdragon chips with Windows on ARM, um, I feel like anything's possible. And that word, that replace word, can I expect to go back with, with, to legacy programs, right? Um, to, to stuff that, that is that, uh, that tax on x86, that tax mm -hmm. on Windows. And whether it's, through, uh, whether it's through AI or whether it's through on-the-fly recompiling, can I expect to replace the gaming PC that I have today with something RISC-V that will run, and I'm not going to ask for 100%, but if I asked for 90% of the software I used to run, do you foresee that? Yeah. Of course. Of course. So more and more, more and more software is written in more in higher level languages, like recompiling C programs in Java and Python and you name it. It's getting easier and easier. Like the architecture mostly doesn't matter. Now, what matters is on a given architecture, like we found this, we started building like a server stack for RISC V. And when they went from Intel to AMD to ARM, to RISC V, each time you port software, it gets easier to do. And the hardest port, by the way, was Intel to AMD, even though they're both x86, right? Really? And that's because there's a whole bunch of proprietary, proprietary software stuff. in the server stack that was actually Intel proprietary. So you weren't, which, by the way, they weren't giving out the port. So they had to rewrite a bunch of stuff, but all the new software is in C, C++, it's clean. So porting the ARM was easier. Right, porting the RISC-V is pretty easy. Um, the thing you find is like the tool chain maturity, like somebody built a binary with some set of switches and then you link that and somebody mislabeled one of the header files and then you, you have to be an expert to figure out why this thing didn't work. But the actual porting of the software is not the, not the hard part. And, Can I interject and RISC-V e ecosystem uses GCC and LLVM and they're really mature compilers. Like they literally use the same compilers on the back end for all the architectures. You mentioned there the server yeah, stack for Risk Five. Um, that's a huge deal, and I know there was there was the struggles with the Intel to AMD transition, and that hampered AMD a bunch of stuff. It, it's going to be a big problem solving the the server stack thing. How's that going? I know you guys are working on it. I know some other companies are yeah, working pretty, on it. Yeah, it's going pretty good. So, and again, this is one of those. So, so Amazon did a really fun thing. So in AWS, they put Graviton in there. Yep. And first they, they ported some of their own applications. So and Amazon's pretty good at putting a gun to somebody's head and saying, you will go you know, port the software and get it running. And then they said, <laughs> yes, sir. And, and they did. You know, and, but then they put it up on the web and said, hey, if you want to you know, port your stuff to ARM, it's 30% cheaper, whatever the number was. And a lot of people said, sure, that's easy. It's JavaScript anyway. Who cares? Right, and so people started porting it, and the more people ported, the better it got. And it's easy to tell if the application, and they made it pretty generic. So I think what you'll see is like heterogeneous data system. So you'll, so you have a cloud, and there'll be some Intel servers for the dinosaur code, and then there'll be ARM and RISC-V for stuff that's already been ported. And there'll be a price difference. And then people will go, you know, where they need to. So yeah, keep, keep converting. Like nobody cares about IBM 360 code or VAX code or Sun code or, you know, HPUX code. Like it's, it's all gone. And, and, and you won't care about the games that you ran 10 years ago because 
there'll be better games, they'll just emulate them, or they'll AI emulate them. Like, that'll be the really funny thing. You'll say, hey, I want to go play Super Mario Brothers, and you'll talk to a computer and, and describe Super Mario Brothers and, and play a little video of, 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 you know, YouTube video from the 80s, you know, that played Super Mario Brothers, and it'll emulate the whole thing, and, and you'll think it's fine. That's kind of terrifying. Uh, I can tell there's you no there's, a, there's a lot of gamers watching this right now that are going to be really unhappy about that. But we're going to move on. We're going to move on, no, guys. No, some of them could be really happy because now they have these games that are going to get pong from this, you know, the 80s and shit. And they'll be able to, like, train an AI engine to play perfectly. Nintendo's and litigating really already. Like Space Invaders, all the stuff that we used to play at bars. I, ca I can hear Nintendo's like, lawyers from here. Yeah. 